I assume since you're here uh, that most of you know who I am, but just for a little bit of context setting, I am going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the background of, of my company and why that's relevant. Because the book that I've written uh, is a combination of a memoir about my time in the technology industry, uh, a business book, and an economic call to action. Uh, on the economics, uh, Hal was my thesis advisor. Uh, uh, the book was, was, was uh, uh, really, uh, uh, I, I don't really know that much about economics, although a couple of people have said, well, but your instincts are good. Uh, but Hal uh, corrected my instincts in many, many cases. Uh, but any errors in the economics portions are not Hal's responsibility. But he definitely would, it would read a passage. He read multiple times. And he would say, no, you have to go read this paper. Oh, you have to go read this paper. Oh, you have to read, go read this paper. It was a wonderful education. And uh, I hope to continue it as I go further down this path. But anyway, so I'm the founder and CEO of O'Reilly Media. Uh, you know, most of you probably maybe first uh, uh, knew of us uh, as a publisher of the iconic animal books. This book uh, now, uh, I think it's still in the sixth edition, uh, VI and Vim. The, the first edition was in 1985. It was one of the first books I ever published. Uh, I think it was in an edition of 100 copies. Uh, it's gone on to sell probably a million copies since then. It's still in print, uh, you know, however many years later, about 32 years later. Uh, but you know, we, we continue to be a publisher with, you know, this, here's a book that we did recently with Google on site reliability engineering, another book on, on uh, hands-on machine learning with scikit-learn and TensorFlow. You know, these are kind of the thing that a lot of people in the computer industry uh, learned of us from. It's now only about 20% of our business. Uh, but the thing I'm kind of the proudest of is the role that I've had in spreading big ideas about where the industry is going and what it ought to do. Um, so very early in the 90s, uh, my company created the first commercial website, the site called the Global Network Navigator. It was sort of before Yahoo, it was the first web portal. It was also the first uh, advertising supported site on the World Wide Web. Uh, the internet was still non-commercial. Needed a lot of activism for uh, uh, the commercial internet, uh, and uh, also for the open commercial internet. In the very early days, uh, for those of you who weren't around then, the internet was a research network. And I still remember a conversation I had with Steve Wolf, who at the time was the NSF overseer, National Science Foundation overseer of uh, the internet. And he said, uh, I said, well, here's what we're planning on doing. We're going to build this website, and it will have ads. But the thing that's different about the web is that people come to you. So we're not going to be sending out anything unless people ask for it. So it's very different. And uh, he said, well, you know, the internet is about research and education. And if, if, if you guys aren't uh, you know, research and education, I don't know who is. So go for it. And it was a wonderful moment. Anyway, I, later I organized the meeting where the term open source software was, was widely adopted and, and, and promoted it, and particularly told a story about it that was bigger than uh, the political movement about free software being against Microsoft by bringing in the story of why the internet was also built on top of open source software. And that was probably my first experience of the power of ideas to change people's minds. You know, I, I remember when I first you know, I held this press conference at the end of this day that came to be called the Open Source Summit. And I had all these guys up on a stage, uh, people who n nobody had ever heard of, uh, most of them, you know, and, and, and the story I told was so different, you know, which had been this story of free software is this uh, rebel movement that wants to bring down commercial software, commercial software is evil. And I said, hey, you know, if you guys have uh, you know, are on the internet and you have a domain name. Yeah, you from the New York Times, you from the Wall Street Journal, whatever. You know, this guy over here, Paul Vixie, wrote the software and gave it away so that that domain name, uh, you know, can be recognized. Uh, oh, if you send email, this guy, Eric Allman, wrote SendMail, the program that routes at that point about 70% of all the email on the internet. Oh, if you have a website, it's probably Apache. This guy, Brian Bellendorf, started that. So I kind of, and it was interesting because I did about two weeks worth of interviews. And in the beginning, what, the internet is based on free software? You know, it was this disbelief. And it felt a little bit like you're trying to push you know, something really heavy and it doesn't move. And then it starts to move. And within two weeks, it was just the accepted wisdom. And that, uh, in, in a way, is a backdrop to the story of the book, because I'm trying to change the accepted wisdom again with this book. So anyway, I did it again with Web 2.0. 
uh, which is really the story uh, for me of what came back after this, the dot-com bust, what was the second coming of the web. And I had come to the conclusion from thinking about open source in a very different way than other people had that, uh, that there was something very different about the companies that survived. And of course, this led me down the path that we're really moving out of the world of, uh, that we knew in the PC era where software was an artifact to where software was increasingly a business process, that there were these vast cloud uh, applications that actually had people inside of them, and that data was going to be the source of competitive advantage. And that was the heart of what I talked about Web 2.0. We also launched something called the Maker Movement with a magazine in 2004 called Make and Maker Fair. I spent a lot of time in the last uh, uh, seven or eight years uh, talking about how government also needs to learn about platforms from the technology industry. And most recently, I've been talking a lot in the same way about how to think differently about AI and what I call the next economy, so technology and the future of work. So we also, the, you know, a big part of our business today are conferences. We just had last week the O'Reilly AI conference. This week uh, in New York, the Strata, the business of data. Uh, we're doing a conference on Jupiter. We've, our original very first conference started in 97, the O'Reilly Open Source Software Summit. We run Maker Faire, uh, uh, something called Food Camp, which Hal talked about, which is an unconference. Uh, and then we have a platform of our own, which we started in 2000. Uh, it's called Safari. It was originally an ebook platform, but it's increasingly a platform. Uh, yes, 40,000 plus ebooks, uh, tens of thousands of hours of video training, live training, millions of customers. And it's really a platform for knowledge exchange. And that's really the heart of our business. We're about 20% books, 30% events, and 50% this, this online learning platform. So I spend a lot of time thinking about platforms because that really is the heart of my business. And, and I think that. Google also obviously is a platform company. But I want to spend a lot of time, I spend a lot of time in the book thinking about digital platforms and what they teach us about economies. So I'm going to come back to that. So the title of the book, WTF. You know, uh, now I actually used this at the White House Frontiers Conference, and I was really proud that I got the White House comms team to sign off on a talk called WTF. Uh, but I, and I did it by kind of saying, well, it stands for what's the future, of course. But really, the reason why I wanted to use the term WTF is because it's a term of astonishment that can be the astonishment of delight or the astonishment of dismay. And I think that really encapsulates the you know, state of our dialogue about technology today. It's this source of enormous astonishment and wonder, and it is also a source of fear. And I, I started worrying about this uh, probably two or three years ago. I started a, a, an event called the Next Economy Summit because I was trying to get ahead of this issue. How do we think about technology and the economy? How do we uh, get technologists to think about it and to talk about it in a way that doesn't make people afraid? How do we get business plans that are focused on empowering people and building wealth for everyone rather than simply, well, we're just going to disrupt. You know, we're going to break things. You know, we're going to make ourselves really, really rich. And we're not going to really worry about what happens to everybody else. And that's how the rest of the world is starting to see Silicon Valley. And in a lot of ways, the book is an attempt to address that narrative head on and to change it. Uh, and, and to change it by actually inspiring uh, software developers and entrepreneurs to act differently, to talk differently, but also to uh, persuade policymakers to think and act differently. So I'm going to try to give you a few a sampling of some of the ideas from the book. But anyway, back to this WTF of amazement or dismay. This is the, the world of techno-optimism that we all live in. You know, that's a chart of life expectancy. Uh, you know, life expectancy at birth, pretty much flat. I mean, there's a few really bad times. Uh, you can kind of see where it really dropped. But then suddenly this magical thing happened in the mid-1800s when it started to climb. And then you see additional countries sort of come on stream. You know, this is the modern world that we have every reason to be so proud of. You know, that we, and, and, you know, there's a wonderful site, Our World in Data, which is really, it's this incredible collection of, of, of graphs and narratives about the way that technology is making the world better. I'm standing in front of this. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, um, so I guess I'll be back over here. Um, so, you know, but everyone is not 
you know, equally happy. We see all Brexit, the rise of Trump, and here's here's this WTF, uh, you know, on the Daily Telegraph, you know, um, and, and you know, the question is, this is not the first time when we have had this kind of upset and worry about technology. This is a you know an etching about the Luddite rebellion. Now, one of the things I learned that uh, many of you may not know is that Ned Ludd did not actually exist. Uh, he, he was not the leader of the Luddites. He was a mythical figure that this particular revolution in 1811, 1812 cited. He was somebody who apparently had smashed a loom 30 years before uh, and went down his story, and they kind of carried the banner of Ned Ludd. Uh, but here's the point. These guys were right to be afraid because the ensuing years were pretty bad. You know, and you think about the early years of, of the Industrial Revolution. And uh, you know William Blake's description of the dark satanic mills. Uh, you know this was not a good time, but you know those weavers could not imagine the wealth of modern society. They couldn't imagine that their descendants would you know that this production, this mass production of fabric, uh, you know would produce. You know, a world in which their grandchildren, great grandchildren, would have more clothing than the kings and queens of Europe did. You know, at, at that turn of the 18th century, or the 19th century, rather. You know, they couldn't imagine. Uh, you know, that their descendants would have. You know, fruit in the middle of winter. They couldn't imagine that we would actually build skyscrapers half a mile high. That we dig a tunnel. Uh, you know, under the you know, English Channel to France, that we'd go into space, that we'd fly through the air. All these things were amazing. And they couldn't imagine that their descendants would find so much meaningful work bringing all these things to life. And so one of the questions I'm asking in the face of today's world of AI and uh, all these new technologies that are, we're being told again and again are going to you know, destroy jobs, what is our failure of imagination? What are we not able to imagine? And what world are we not able to paint for our grandchildren of the world to come? And so you know, one of the things that I, I, I start the book with is a little excursion into this idea of fitness landscapes. Now, you know, in evolutionary biology, there's this idea that genes contribute to the survival of an organism. And you can think about this as kind of a landscape of, of peaks and valleys. And organisms uh, evolve towards the peaks, which are adapted to their environment, or they die out. And so there's this lo the concept of a local maximum. And you know, a lot of what happens is society and companies get comfortable with this local maximum. And they don't know how to move on. And often, the only way to move off of it is actually to go backwards. You, know, you have to go down. And that's why we have this cycle sometimes of, of revolutions, of, of uh, you know, companies you know, fall apart. Anyway, but uh, you know, fitness landscapes are you know, dynamic. You know, uh, when conditions are stable, you can kind of just stay there. But if things are changing, uh, not not so so good. And of course, we have uh, you know radically changing conditions. You know, climate change is a great example. If you look at the failure of many civilizations in the past, they were driven by climate change. We may uh, face a great deal of pressure on our fitness landscape uh, today as a result of that. Uh, and technology. Also has a fitness landscape. You know, uh, you know. In my career, I watched you know this fitness landscape of the personal computer. Uh, you know, the big data and AI world uh, that, that you know Google lives in. The smartphone uh, landscape dominated. That was you know, sort of really broken open by Apple, and now is sort of a subject of fierce competition between Google and Apple. And you know, what's really interesting when you think about what happened? Why was it hard for Microsoft to get to the big data world? Well, they had too much. You know, this is a perfect illustration of the fitness landscape. They had a business model that really worked for them, and they fought. You know, there were people who were saying, "No, we got to get with the internet," and they were kind of like, "No, we have to preserve Windows," and that was their priority. And I think it's something that we always have to to, um, to think about. The, the, this do, the dominant companies, you know, tend to be slow to adapt. So. Um, you know, the, the thing is that one of the problems is that those dominant companies tend to extract too much of the value from the ecosystem for themselves. You know, Microsoft basically put other companies out of business. They would come down to Silicon Valley, meet with VCs, and say, you can't invest there because we're going to do that. Uh, and, and this is a real risk, I think, for Google as well. You know, it, it, it's really, I think, a mistake to think about uh, just value for users. 
You know, because Google will make a case, uh, well, we're doing this thing and it's better for our customers. But you actually have to think about the whole ecosystem. And in particular, you have to think about the ecosystem of developers. You know, the, you know people uh, you know, went to Linux and the World Wide Web because there was no room left in the Microsoft ecosystem. So they went somewhere where they didn't think they were going to go make a lot of money over on the web. They just went, this is cool, this is interesting, and it's free and open. And, and that sort of free and open was what gave birth to the new fitness landscape, you know, the, the, the small mammals coming up from the, the valleys into this new fitness peak. So again, it's always something to worry about if you're as dominant as Google, uh, is, is to think about, you know, are we making enough value for these developers who are part of our ecosystem, these people who are creating on top of our platform and making it a rich, stable ecosystem? Or are we basically saying, no, no, we're, you know, we, we have to do that for ourselves. You know, I had that experience many times with Microsoft. You know, it's like, oh, that's a great idea. We have to do that. Sorry. Uh, so in our, in our political landscape, we're seeing this same thing. You know, we've had this idea that by making a small number of people very, very, very wealthy, uh, it would trickle down to the rest of society. It hasn't entirely worked that way. And guess what? You know, the people are moving somewhere else. They're saying, we don't like that consensus about how to run the world. Uh, we're going to do it differently. They may even be wrong. It may be, a, you know, well, <laughs> not, in my opinion, not even a may, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's a, a real serious risk that the conditions that we have, th uh, you know, that we Silicon Valley uh, have used to thrive are going to change radically because of the political environment. And so, you know, one of the, the key pieces of advice I give in my book is, is just to remember that a successful ecosystem creates opportunity for everyone. And, and, and this obviously was brought into the, you know, the political discourse by Thomas Piketty's book, Capital, uh, in the 21st century, where he really addressed this question of inequality and got everybody talking about it. There have been other people, you know, Joe Stieglitz had written about the 99% versus the 1% before Piketty had come out, but, and that, that almost caught, but you know, you know, when Piketty's book came out, it was like everybody started talking about it. And so I decided to take a technological uh, angle on all this, to kind of tell this story from the point of view of the tech industry, because a lot of people are talking about it as economists. And I was, so in, in a lot of ways, the heart of the book is, is a series of stories about what the great technology platforms have to tell us about the future of business and the economy. And the first is this point I've already made, that platforms have to work for all their participants, not just for the users or the platform owner. There's also the point that Platforms today are no longer just about the digital, right? They're enmeshed in the real world. You know, you think about you know, Uber or Lyft. Uh, you know, this is really this system. You think about this huge algorithmic system. And sure, there are people at the endpoints of all the touch points of Google. You know, people who are uploading YouTube videos, or they're clicking on links, or they're they're submit, you know, creating web pages. But boy, it becomes really obvious that human beings are, uh, as this uh, Sean McMullen, the science fiction author, called, are, are souls in the great machine. You know, when you have these cars dispatched by algorithm with drivers, you have this swarming marketplace where people are doing things in the, in the real world uh, you know, at the beck and call of algorithms. So, uh, so you know, we have to start thinking about you know, this interpenetration of the digital into all of our business processes, into all of our world, uh, you know, as, uh, as we effectively take the principles that we've been practicing in the purely digital realm for uh, the last couple of decades and start to see them show up everywhere in the real world. So it becomes even more important. Uh, and the third key point uh, is that the fundamental function of every technology is that it augments people so they can do things that were previously impossible. You know, we couldn't fly through the air, and now we can. And so when you think about you know, what AI is going to do, there's a, a strong narrative that it's going to put people out of work. And instead, I think the narrative, we need to be seeking out the narrative of what will it let us do that we can't do today, that will be wonderful, that will make us full of that WTF of delight. And we have to tell that story powerfully, and we have to believe it, and we have to 
build products and startups that deliver on that promise. So, um, you know, and there is kind of this interesting thing that, of course, the WTF of delight becomes banal. I still remember uh, once uh, landing in Sydney Airport in Australia, and they had this giant mural. And I, I wish I could find the name of the photographer because it's long gone now. But it was thousands of people turned out to see the first airplane come to Australia. You know, and it was just this, these faces looking up in wonder. You know, you know, it's been a voyage of you know, many months you know, for many you know, people that emigrated. And then it's like they're connected to the world. And it's like, oh my god. And now you think about you know, the airlines, oh my god. You know? <laughs> you know, so the WTF of wonder actually later became the WTF of dismay. And we have to watch out for that. But the, um, uh, you know, that, that source of wonder is so important. But this idea of, of augmentation, let me kind of come back to Uber and Lyft. You know, when you think about that uh, experience, there's a couple of things. The first is this magical experience, which goes away because you get used to it. Uh, wow, I can, you know, I don't have to call a taxi company and hope they show up. I don't have to stand out on the street corner and wave and know they're all full or there's nobody there. I can summon a car, I get an estimate of when it's going to be there, and I walk out and it just comes. Magic. You know, realizing the capability that was hidden in our phones uh, to, to match people in a real time matching marketplace. Right? But also, and this is one of the things a lot of people don't understand about Uber and Lyft. You know, it's like taxi companies go, oh, well, we have to have an app. Uh, yeah, but we hate this idea of, of part-time drivers who just you know, show up and don't have licenses. And they go, well, guess what? All the parts of that business model work together. Uh, because it's because you have those part-time drivers that you can have three-minute pickup times uh, all the time. You don't run out of cabs, right? Because they're harnessing the marketplace uh, in this new algorithmic way. And the reason they can do that is because the drivers are augmented with this new cognitive augmentation called Google Maps. You know, Waze, or you know, it's built now into, into the app. You know, it's like people don't have to have the knowledge of the streets and monuments of London. They can just turn on the app, and it says, "Turn right here," right? And you know, the, the, literally, the knowledge is a test where you are a human GPS. You're like a Mentat out of Frank Herbert's Dune. You know, where you literally they give you two points in London, and you have to recite the turn by turn to get from one to the other. And you know, now you don't have to do that. So that, that cognitive augmentation also is going to make new things possible. Just like the steam shovel or the you know, steel girder or the steel beam in the physical world, cognitive augmentation allows people to do new things that they couldn't do before. So um, I also talk a lot about the fact that these systems are algorithmic systems, at least today, infused with AI. But these algorithmic systems have a a sort of a fitness function or an objective function. And I want to talk about that in the context of the economy in a bit. Because I think the real, uh, there's real significance for society, the economy, and the future of the human race in the algorithms that we are building into our future. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So there's a uh, uh, bunch of my writing on the topic that's not in the book. You can find it at the site WTFeconomy.com, as well as some content that's in the book. Anyway, I'm going to come back to this notion. A platform must create more value than it captures. That's been uh, kind of the heart of what we try to do at O'Reilly. Um, uh, you know, we invited in our biggest competitors into our platform when we launched it. Uh, we continue to think about how do we make money for them as well as for us. Uh, and I think Google, should, and I, I've loved what Hal has done with the Google economic impact reports because it's starting to tell a story which should be told by every business in America, every business in the world, which is how are we creating value for other people, for others, not just for ourselves. All this financial reporting that's just about, wow, look how well we're doing. Great. I go, well, how, you know, there are companies that are doing well by making other people do badly. And we have to actually have a system wide accounting of what people are putting in and what they're taking out. And the alternative, if you are a Google like company, where you are a systematic platform company is you become a regulated utility. Because if people say, wow, you are not uh, you know, looking after your ecosystem, well, we'll look after it for you. So I think I, that's something you guys should be very worried about. Anyway, I want to kind of come back. I've talked about a lot of this already. But this is something out of the book, uh, this notion of uh, what I call a business model map. A business model is 
the way that all the parts of a business work together to create customer value. And uh, I first was introduced to this concept by some consultants called Dan and Meredith Beam back in 2000. And they actually uh, used the example of Southwest Airlines uh, versus Hub and Spoke Airlines. And they kind of went through how all the parts of, of Southwest uh, business actually make them very different than the other airlines, even though they're both all in the airline business. You know, so they don't forward baggage. They don't have assigned seats. This actually uh, is different. And, and so Google and Facebook, both in the advertising business, but you have very different parts of your business model. So for example, uh, with, with Google, right? Somebody, your customer succeeds when they come to Google, get what they want, and go away. Right? So your success is aligned with people leaving Google, coming and leaving. Facebook's success is aligned with having people come and stay. And that's a huge difference in your business model and a huge lever if you are competing with Facebook, for example, because you have to say, oh, wow, we have to find more reasons to get people to go away and not to get people to come and stay with us, because then you're, pl you're, you're playing on, on Facebook's uh, um, you know, turf. And as Sun Tzu says, attack your enemy where he is strong and you are weak. I mean, where he is weak and you are strong. So anyway, back to this. Um, I tried to draw a, a, a model of Uber because it seemed to me to be uh, kind of a, a, uh, a kind of a template for what's starting to happen in the economy. You know, you have these companies that are platforms. They're not just sort of traditional companies. You know, they're replacing ownership with access. You know, and they've got this, this marketplace managed by an algorithm, you know, with passengers matching up passengers and drivers. And there's a bunch of things, you know, workers supplying their own cars, independent contractors, you know, that are really part of this, uh, you know, this story. And, uh, you know, this augmented workers idea that we talked about, magical ex user experience. So all of these things go together. And one of the things we have to understand as we think about technology and the economy is what things go together in our business model. What things belong and what things fight against it? And so, for example, at O'Reilly, one of the things that we've you know, realized that made us able to transition from being a publishing company to being a conference company and an online learning company was that we realized we were, we were really a company that was about connecting people who knew something with people who wanted to learn it from them. And so we were able to evolve how we did that because we really understood that, whereas a lot of our competitors uh, you know, most of them no longer really in the business very much. They just thought their job was to capture knowledge into books and put it on shelves. So anyway, so uh, I, I, you know, I spend some time really trying to think through business models and how they work and how they're changing in the age of the platform. Uh, I've talked a little bit about this uh, thick marketplace idea. Uh, Hal's uh, 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 student, Jonathan Hall, who's the chief economist at Uber, turned me on to this book, uh, Alvin Roth's uh, Who Gets What and Why, uh, which is really about uh, you know, how do you make a successful matching marketplace, which is at the heart of so many of the great platforms today. And so that kind of led me to this, you know, this path of, of, of thinking about marketplaces. But then, uh, again, I talked about this augmented uh, you know, worker concept. But there's a really key part of it. Uh, and that is really something I call the arc of knowledge. You know, when we think about how do we communicate knowledge, we first you know, we, we, we spoke it to each other. And then we wrote it down, you know, things like maps. And, and you think about the first you know, iterations of online maps. And they were kind of reproductions of printed maps just online, which was kind of nice. And then you got maps and directions. And you go all the way up to automated vehicles. And you see that the knowledge disappears into a service. And that seems to me to be a key point to remember when you think about how are we augmenting workers. We're basically building these cognitive augmentations that will just disappear into services, where you don't necessarily need to know in advance things. You know, this is already so true. You know, we were talking over lunch about how, oh yeah, yeah, some technique. How do you learn it? You go to YouTube and you watch the video. And before long, maybe we will be in the place like Trinity in the Matrix where we can say, I need to know how to fly a helicopter. You know, remember she downloads the knowledge. You know, but even without that, we're going to have these augmented devices that capture and share human knowledge. So when I think about you know, AI, that's my starting point, is that it's a tool for human augmentation. It isn't this radical you know, discontinuity, you know, this machine from the future that's going to make humans obsolete, any more than 
you know, uh, machines you know, of the industrial era were s somehow going to make humans obsolete. You know, sure, yeah, we're not as strong probably as most of our, uh, you know, uh, even if we work out a lot, we're probably not as strong or as fit as, as someone who worked every day on the farm or doing, you know, pre you know, work. I still remember going to Hawaii once and, you know, huffing and puffing up over some hill, and it was like, oh yeah, the, you know, the ancient Hawaiians took them about 20 minutes to go up and over to the other, you know, waterfall, and it took us two hours. You know, um, yeah, you know, we're not, you know, as fit, but we are more capable. You know, if you've ever read Guns, Germs, and Steel, you know, it opens with this wonderful you know, passage, Yaley's question, this you know, guy in, in, in New Guinea saying, you, know, you guys are so stupid. You know, if I took you in the jungle, you'd be dead in two weeks. How come you have all the cargo? You know? <laughs> and, and, you know, and that is, in fact, the question of our civilization. You know, it's like we are making you know, uh, ourselves smarter, stronger, faster, better. And that should be how we frame and how we think about what we're doing with technology. It's not disrupt, it's not destroy, it's not eliminate, it's empower, it's lift up, it's make things possible. So, you know, technology is our superpower, you know, and, and this is another one of the charts from, um, you know, our, our world and data of, uh, you know, the number of people in the world living in absolute poverty. And you watch that incredibly steep decline, that's wonderful. But inequality is our kryptonite. And we have, you know, this is, uh, you know, from the, we are the 99% story. We have to confront that. We have to think about it as a, particularly as a, as a society, but also as an industry. So one of my interesting questions uh, is, uh, that I try to explore in the book, is what keeps us from creating prosperity for everyone? And here's the answer. And this is the connected taxi cab circa 2005. Uh, you know, it's like, wow, we had connected tax cabs. What do we do? We put a screen in the back where people could look up information, where they could watch ads. You know, and we totally missed, you know, even though actually Sunil Paul in 2000 had written a, a series of patents about what would be possible uh, if you, you know, you tried to connect, you know, cars with smartphones. And actually, they weren't really even smartphones, but with GPS and phones. It was just too early, right? So there was this sort of cognitive filter, this cognitive blindness, you know, you call it actually sort of framing blindness, maybe the right way to say it, where we framed the world in a particular way. And we couldn't see what was possible. And I think this is a, a critical problem. And I've watched it throughout my career. You know, when I, I, I in 2000, I had led this uh, protest against uh, uh, Jeff Bezos' one-click patent. And we went and we looked, uh, you know, Jeff kind of uh, worked with me to try to, uh, you know, turn it around from a, from a PR point of view. And one of the things we did was we, we started, a, 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 we funded a startup called Bounty Quest, which looked for prior art on, you know, one-click shopping. And we couldn't find it. Because basically, it was sort of unthinkable at the time. People were afraid to put their credit cards online. They had the, sh the shopping cart metaphor. They kind of understood the world. It was very much like this connected taxi cab circa 2005. So I, I, the reason I tell you that story, actually, and here's another one. You know, it's like I asked Tony Fidel, why didn't you, know, uh, you guys do the connected speaker? And he says, well, can you imagine you know, if, if uh, people had, had thought, Google is listening to me? You know, somebody had to make that possible first, you know, because there was just this, you know, because of Google's particular, you know, position in the market, you couldn't be the first mover. But you still have to understand that these cognitive shifts do happen where people believe that something else is possible. But more than that, I want to actually take that thinking to the political and the economic realm. And this is where I start to get out of my depth in the book. <laughs> but uh, but I, this is, maybe it's just a thought experiment, but maybe, just maybe, it's uh, something that's really worth thinking about. And, and this is the beginning of, of actually an argument that runs through a, a central section of the book. And it's about sort of AI and algorithmic systems and their relationship to human society. And I ask the question, you know, what if strong AI bears the same relationship to today's narrow AI as multicellular life does to its single-celled forebears. Now, right now, we keep thinking that we're going to create a strong AI. Maybe, you know, maybe it'll be 15, 20 years from now. Maybe it'll be 50. Maybe it'll be 100. But it'll be like us, you know, a single self-aware being. And you know, I wonder if instead, you know, it's a collective being. 
And it turns out that that is what happened in this prokaryotic to eukaryotic cell transition. Because it turns out that this is thing that uh, Lynn Margulis in 1967, actually it was, I think it was originally in, in uh, uh, a guy named uh, Constant and Marachowski in uh, 2000, no, 1905 had first proposed it, but she picked it up in 67 and actually proved it over, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of years of being ridiculed and pushed back on. And it was this idea that, uh, that multicellular organisms actually incorporated bacteria into them. You know, so it turns out, uh, it was later substantiated by genetic evidence that mitochondria uh, in our body are actually bacteria that came and lived inside of us, right? Uh, same thing with chloroplasts in plants. They're, they're, they have totally different genetic material than the nucleus of the cell. And so in a similar way, I start thinking, well, what if we are somehow like that with our computers? And, and of course, biological uh, symbiosis doesn't start with that symbiogenesis that Lynn Margulis talked about. There's also this increasing knowledge of the microbiome, how we are really a colony organism. Ed Young, in his wonderful book, I Contain Multitudes, says all zoology is really ecology. You know, uh, you know when we look at beetles and elephants, sea urchins and earthworms, parents and friends, we see individuals you know, uh, driven by a single brain and operating with a single genome. And this is a pleasant fiction. You know, we're legion. You know, he says, heed Walt Whitman. I am large. I contain multitudes. So think about this in humans, too. You know, when we talk about um, you know, unsupervised learning as the holy grail of AI, I go, yeah, you know, humans have some amount of unsupervised learning. We have a shit ton of supervised learning. You know, we learn our language from our parents. Uh, everything we, you know, we know that makes us able to, you know, to do the kinds of things that we do here at Google. We were taught by somebody. And then on top of that, yes, we're able to do unsupervised learning. But we have a long way to go, uh, you know, I think, in, in the supervised learning of this new organism before we can kind of even expect to see it start to do unsupervised. It's not like you start necessarily there. But um, you know, so, so thinking about this as a metaphor, I started thinking about, I've been really thinking about this for the last you know, 10, 15 years, you know, how increasingly we're all, all human, humanity is being woven into this new global mind, the super AI, you know, and we're seeing in things like uh, fake news kind of the equivalent of our neuroses, you know, the, the equivalent of, of uh, you know, of, of bad ideas, you know, they spread incredibly quickly now and are adopted by, you know, millions of people and then encoded further into the systems that we build. You know, so we're this really interesting phase of symbiosis, and we have to come and understand it. And uh, so if we think that our emergent proto-AIs are also compound beings, just like we are, what would we do differently? How would we think about them? And what do we know about them today? And uh, you know, there's a lot of fear of some kind of future hostile AI. And I go, well, if there is one, we are already training it. We are already teaching it. And what are we teaching it? So you know, when you think about this further, you know, we, we're seeing you know, this compound being. You know, this, we see the, the rise of specialized chips, which actually uh, you know, is actually a pretty interesting imitation of neuroscience. But here is a great one. You know, here, here's one of the, uh, you know, the mitochondria inside uh, the Google brain. Right, uh, and uh, you know, here's this thing we've even defined in our legal system. Starting in 1888, we said that there's this thing called a corporate person. It's really just this collective organism. You know, the, 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 it was the case called consolidated silver mining uh, versus Pennsylvania. And it's like under the designation of person, there's no doubt that a private corporation is included in the 14th Amendment. Such corporations are merely associations of individuals united for special purpose. Right? So you know, special purpose organism. You know, and guess what? We now have these special purposes organisms are increasingly digital, increasingly quick, increasingly algorithmic. We are making these special purpose organisms. Uh, uh, and, and what are we asking them to do? And I believe that one of the things that we have to come to grips with is that in some ways, these AIs that are our children are already ruling human society. And we have to ask ourselves, what is the motivation of this new species? Now, this is obviously you know, kind of out there. But think about it. You know, how does Google decide what it's going to do? Well, we actually 
we collectively, you know, starting with Larry and Sergey and uh, you know all the early founders, but people like Hal and all of you have actually put thoughts into this, you know, shared Google brain. You've trained it, you've taught it, and you've taught it uh, that it should optimize for relevance. And this is this sort of master organizing objective function of everything that Google does, whether it's in search or advertising. It's like find the thing that people are looking for. So you've kind of built this special purpose organism that has you know, these, these goals built into it, baked into it. And those goals actually now exist independently of any of the people who created it. Like, again, they, they, they will, you know, it will die just like a, a, you know, a, you know, a biological organism will die under certain conditions. But it doesn't actually depend on any individual cells to remain. You know, we've all been told that our bodies can completely recycle, be completely different cells uh, you know, every seven years, I think it is. And you know, same thing. All the people could cycle out, and this organism would continue uh, with the same programming, with this continual ad adapting program. So think about that. So Google, relevance. Facebook, engagement. And we saw with Facebook and fake news how that can go wrong. You know, and it basically reminds me, I guess, of, of, of the story of Mickey Mouse and the broomsticks in Fantasia. You know, I mean, all of these systems, we tell them what to do and we set them going. And they do what we told them to do, but it isn't, we don't necessarily quite understand it. And this is the story that comes out again and again in Arabian mythology, you know, with genies. And, uh, you know, you, you told them, uh, uh, this is actually an illustration by Edmund Dulac uh, from the Thousand and One Nights. Uh, it's sort of a rising of great power, but what's it going to do? It's going to do what we told it, but we, maybe we didn't understand it. We didn't tell it quite right. Mark thought that by building this social platform that was focused on engagement, you know, he would build real community. And then he found instead that we've created this monster, which he's now trying to bring back under control. You know, that's actually part of the experience. So uh, many years ago, uh, a friend of mine said to me, this is in the early days of Macintosh programming, he said, the art of debugging is figuring out what you really told your program to do rather than what you thought you told it to do. And we are right now engaged in that process with these these new digital gin that we have created, we are saying, are they doing what we meant? Are, we do, are they doing you know, what we told them to do but wasn't quite what we asked? And how do we fix that? That's what you do every day at Google. You try to actually go, yes, is it doing what we really meant it to do? And now my question is, are we doing that same thing in our broader society? You know, because here's the data that we see that is you know, at the heart of this economic unease that we're facing, which is that this wonderful gift, the WTF of amazement, is that productivity has continued to go up. You know, if you look, this is from yeah, 1945 up through 2015. And it's pretty, my God, it's a, it's, it's a graph that Ray Kurzweil would be proud of. It's just up and to the right, right? And then you see this divergence starting around 1970s uh, of real family income. Somehow that productivity was not getting through, not being distributed to ordinary people. Now, there's a lot of reasons why that may have gone wrong. There's, you know, and people like Hal study this uh, and, and, and his, 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 uh, his ilk. This is what economists do. Uh, and I'm not saying what I'm proposing is the only cause, but I think it is one of them. And that is this. Here's another one of these AIs, these proto-AIs, you know, that we tell it what to do. And is it really doing what we think? And this is the Equinix NY4 data center, you know, which is sort of one of the hearts of, the, of our financial trading system. And this is kind of the Skynet of the story. Because ultimately, we told these, the, our financial system what its objective function should be. Uh, Milton Friedman in 1970 wrote an article uh, in the New York Times called The Social Responsibility of Business is to Increase Its Profits. The businesses should not think about anything other than that. And if they did that, they would pass along the profits to the shareholders, and the shareholders could make up their own mind. And this is a perfectly reasonable thesis, just like some of the theses that you put into your code. But when you build code and you watch it, you, do, you actually do that debugging process. You say, did it do what I, what I asked it to do? And we have to ask ourselves, when we said, 
you know, optimize for share price, you know, in particular, you know, optimize for profits, and the profits, this proxy is the share price of companies. Optimize for that, not for people. Oh, you know, yeah, if it makes sense, you know, outsource the factories. If it makes sense, gut that community, you know, because you know, your, your master fitness function, the thing that we, the wish that we expressed to the genie we built was make my share price go up. And, uh, you know, this is actually, there are a lot of people in the financial industry who are starting to take note of this. I mean, you know, uh, uh, Larry Fink, who runs BlackRock, the largest asset manager in the world, has been railing about stock buybacks. Uh, Warren Buffett questioning them. There's a number of books. This one, Makers and Takers, is really good. Another one, The Golden Passport, about uh, how Harvard Business School kind of wrecked the economy. But so this idea that the financial markets, you know, which are really meant to support the human economy, have become this extractive platform that basically says, no, 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 give the money to us. You know? and, and we have to actually reverse that. And that's when I want to come back to this story about the uh, little screen in the back of the taxi cab and the failure of imagination. Because it's very hard for us to imagine a completely different world. You know, so when we talk about tax reform, well, it's like we'll push this rate up and that rate down. You know, that's not how it happens. The great revolutions are ones where you really imagine the world anew. And we're good at that in technology. We think about that all the time. And we need to do it also in the world of politics and the economy. And we have done that before. You know, when the founders of this country you know, got together and said, we're going to try to build a new country with a new set of ideas. You know, oh my god, you know, there's that famous story about King George, you know, when, when George Washington stepped down. You know, uh, uh, you know, so basically, originally, you know, when, when and he won the war, you know, all the Europeans expected that George Washington would become the king of America. And, and, and George III, as a reporter, said, you know, and he went back to his farm and said, and, George, and, he, and, and King George said, if he has done that, uh, he is the greatest man the world has ever seen. It was this unthinkable thing, you know, so much more unthinkable than Uber was to a taxi company or that one click was to a, an e-commerce site. It was amazing, you know, and we can do that. You know, so if we are entering a world where AI can do so much more of the jobs that we do today, you know, we should not be content to say, well, we'll just kind of keep feeding the current system. You know, I, I, Cory Doctorow, the science fiction writer, had this great uh, uh, statement on social media recently where he said, uh, economists uh, use equations to justify the divine right of capital the way that court astrologers used uh, the stars to justify the divine right of kings. And, you know, whether it's true or not, it's true in the spiritual world. You know, <laughs> this idea that, you know, we, we basically justify the system as it is rather than imagining the system as it could be. And I see this enormous opportunity to make a more prosperous world with all of these technologies we have. You know, so you know, uh, the, what makes me hopeful is, first of all, that when we build these algorithmic systems, we can start to see ourselves better. Bias encoded and taken to scale becomes visible. You know, when, you know, when we have been uh, arresting blacks at a much higher rate, and not seeing it, it's just kind of in the woodwork. You know, we go, well, it's human bias, you know, sure. But then all of a sudden when you're going, wow, we're baking it into the, into the algorithms because we're using these training data sets that are based on you know, decades of bias policing, we can suddenly see it. We can fix it. We can debug our society. You know, so that's the first thing. You know, it's like this whole engagement, this digitalization of, of our world is going to help us understand our world and make it better. And the second thing, you know, AI is going to help us to understand more deeply what is human. And it, and it can create new kinds of beauty. And I, I love this, uh, this uh, statement from the 37th move of the second game. Uh, it was uh, Fan Hui uh, talking about it. He says, it's not a human move. I've never seen a human play this move. So beautiful. You know, this idea that something new that we have not imagined can be beautiful that it can not be something to be afraid of, that it can be something wonderful. That's the world that I think we in the technology industry should be committed to creating. And finally, 
just want to remember that it isn't technology that wants to eliminate jobs. Uh, my friend Nick Hanauer said technology is the solution to human problems. We won't run out of work until we run out of problems. So like, I think we all in our industry have to commit ourselves to solving human problems. Make it work. Make the world a better place. So that's the master design pattern of technology and, and really the message of the book. You know, our job is to augment people so they can do things that were previously impossible. Thanks. Well, Tim, thanks so much for coming. I'm really excited to read your book. Uh, I was just curious, you know, as someone who's been in the publishing and content industry for the past 20 years, why, when you think about sort of like transmitting these ideas about the future, why you chose to do it in the form of a book? When there's like, you know, there's lots of different tools out there today. And, and like, so as someone who's thought a lot about this, I'm just, you know, kind of curious, like, what, like, why did you choose to canonicalize it in yeah, this form? Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Actually, you know, probably the trigger <laughs> was um, that I had, uh, I've been running this event called the Next Economy Summit. And I was trying to get on Michael Krasny's uh, you know, show, the local PBS show. And I just was having a lot of trouble. And then somebody who had written a book that I really didn't respect sort of you know, appears on the show. And I'm like, damn. You know, it's like it's, for, for a certain kind of intellectual discussion, it is still uh, you know, the, the little entry card. You know, like I couldn't get in this room without the Google entry card. And you know, writing the book gets you discussed by the policymakers. Because that's the thing. You know, all these people who should be deeply involved in the digital because it's the center of our world, nah. You know, I mean, this is a book that I can send. I can put in front of a policymaker, have them read, uh, have the think tanks in DC uh, talk about. I can give talks there because I wrote a book. You know? And otherwise, I'm, I'm some weird new media guy. And of course, you've been a publisher for 30 years. Yeah, which is ironic. <laughs> and, and actually, I, I didn't publish it myself. I actually went to one of the traditional business publishing uh, you know, companies because, again, it's, sort of, it's, it's just this credentialing function. Uh, Tim, uh, excellent set of hypotheses. Um, but one of them is the, who are the actors of change? Obviously, we talk about very big things like Uber today that started as very small things. Do you have any conclusions you draw about this, whether innovation is possible as they can get, quote, more multicellular? at the small stage, garage stage, individual startup stage, or would you be thinking that as data gets a gravity of its own, that we're going to see a return to bigness for its own sake, and that yeah. that's potential for like, startups in this world? Well, I, I do think, first of all, the power of ideas is profound. Uh, you know, uh, even you know, if a startup doesn't survive, it can actually place a new idea into the world. And that idea can be taken up. And um, you know, that's, that is you know, why create more value than you capture is sort of part of my motto. You know, I just believe, yes, you know, in the end, we're all going to fail. You know, and and I, I, I've often quoted this wonderful poem of Rilke, what we fight with is so small. And when we win, it makes us small. What we want is to be defeated decisively by successively greater beings. He's talking about wrestling with the angels. And I, I, I think that. Um, so yes, that may be a risk of, of bigness. But I think, actually, if you, you know, follow the job of doing something that needs doing, you know, like uh, you know, I, one, of my, one of the companies I talk about at the end of the book where I kind of try and give some hopefulness is the company Zipline. Right? So here's a company that's using drones and on demand. And they're not like, we're going to be the Uber of dry cleaning. They're, they're like, uh, you know, we're going to be the Uber of blood delivery in, in a country where uh, people, you know, where the leading cause of, of, of death in women is, is postpartum hemorrhage. You know, there's no developed hospital infrastructure. There's, uh, you know, bad roads. But you can get a drone anywhere in the country in 20 minutes, you know, and bang, you know, it's like, that's astonishing. You know, that's like, wow, we can solve a problem uh, that's a real problem with this magical technology. And guess what? They're kind of not there in their, you know, in that normal competitive landscape because they've actually found this green field of opportunity, which is solving a real problem. And I think, uh, you know, if, if, if when 
you know, sure, the Me Too space, pretty crowded. If you want to go, yeah, can I, can I make another social network? Kind of hard, you know, prob but there's another piece to it, too, which I've been, I had a, a debate with Reed Hoffman recently because he's got a book coming out on blitz scaling. And I was like, look, Reed, if, if you know, it's like you've got to raise lots of money because you have to grow faster than your competitors and, you know, so on and so forth. It's still a winner takes all. Somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. And one of the things I want to hear more is, uh, um, like, how are these platforms enabling an ecosystem? You know, it kind of goes back to this sort of platform thinking. You know, and you look at, uh, you know, how Google has been an enabler, how YouTube is an enabler. You know, there's people getting work from this. And I think uh, one of the things that I, I think in a world of winner-takes-all platforms, the platforms themselves have to think more about how are we going to enable a network of small business. Thank you.